Hi, hi everybody. Um, it's genuine here. Um, calling from Scotland, all the ways, uh, the land of the Titans. Um, yes, I'm honored to be here uh, to join you all. Um, thank you for waiting. Uh, technology can be a boss of us at times, um, pushing us out of computers that we had prepared to be there on time. But um, extend my apologies for uh, your patience. Um, yes, I'm superbly honored to be here. So I could say uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, uh, good evening, depending on what time zone you're based. I understand that Open University is an international university, and therefore uh, we both come from a very different background to be here. Uh, and so um, I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, according to that, uh, according to you that. Um, so, dear delegates, um, friends, colleagues, alumni of um, uh, long-standing members, uh, the, the chair, the president, uh, the managers, and everyone who has worked so hard to make this possible for me and you to meet here today and celebrate um, uh, the coming together of us all. Um, yes, so my name is Genuine. Uh, Genuine Jackson Mwasher. Uh, I am a graduate of law degree, um, Open University 2021. Um, started my university 20, uh, 2015, uh, right after I had my firstborn. Uh, he was working at the time, uh, if I might tell you. So today I'm here uh, specifically to brag about my journey with Open University, and uh, hopefully you will accord me that uh, bragging space. Um, but yes, so first, how did this all came about? So uh, I'll take you a little bit back to my early life. Um, I have been made possible by many people, uh, kind. I, I grew up, my upbringing at the beginning wasn't so pleasant. I, I was um, a street child and uh, in an orphanage uh, from the age of two. Um, it's not something that any child need to or will want to go through or will be wished to be going through that. So my beginning of life at age of two, I was a free person uh, roaming the streets in the slopes of Mount Kilimanjaro. Uh, that is in East Africa, uh, the highest and, um, and long standing mountain in, in Africa. And of course, the only the highest uh, a mountain in Africa, and of course, I think the third in the world. Now, that's why I was roaming at uh, the age of two uh, due to a family breakdown uh, uh, where my father had me in um, with his younger, youngest wife. And um, having that started off my life uh, because the family wouldn't allow that to happen uh, simply because the cultural things when you're born at that age younger male to an old man you automatically becomes the head of everything so everyone who came before you will have to bow to you uh, for the inheritance their rights and everything so my brothers are from uh, my stepmothers who came before my mother were not ready for that to happen therefore they attempted uh, to take my life uh, before I was born and then even after um, and so that put my father in a uh, complexity of moral to think whether shall he see me die while he's still alive um, and which something that he wasn't prepared to do I think his fear drove him to take me to a junction in which um, he left me there, of course, after he prayed and committed me to the mountains. They got mountains at the time. Uh, my father was very old at the time when he had me. Uh, so he was around 70, 70 something. Um, he was only young, 70, 79. So, 79 when, when he had me. So, um, but then he couldn't protect me. Uh, but that became a part of where my life started off. I wandered off to our. Uh, a farm that was owned by a uh, German uh, and they became the people who gave me the first home so his workers offered me my first home uh, look after me 
uh, until I was probably, I think, five. And uh, his operation was closed down, and therefore I found myself wandering through the streets. And there I was, um, going through communities, churches, markets, uh, until the age of seven or so. And I stumbled into an orphanage. Uh, this uh, was a British owned at the time. Um, and that's where I had my first uh, proper bed to sleep in, proper shoes. And, and therefore, at the age of seven, I started my um, I, kindergarten. I, you know, you, you'll expect the child here starting a kindergarten at the age of seven, that's way late. So I started my kindergarten at the age of seven, and now I was there until the age of nine. And I think I properly learned properly when I was 10 is when I started my primary education, very late in life. And, and so, uh, that proceeded, uh, but somewhere in the middle there, before finishing my primary school, I stumbled upon a family that uh, gave me a, uh, uh, a home, and, uh, and of course they became my parents at the time, uh, British missionaries at the time, they were working in Africa, so I became their uh, fifth child, sixth child, and uh, they have uh, made me uh, they made me possible um, in terms of retraining, showing me love, uh, educated me, uh, put me into school, and that journey uh, continued. Fast forward, I, I'm in Scotland, I have a family, I have a child, and I'm thinking, then what is for me? And, and therefore, there is no way to think, where am I going to go? I'm a little bit late in life, uh, and therefore, stumbled upon Open University. And where they says, you know, uh, your dreams are open. So that's where my JD started 2015. I enrolled um, a law degree. And specifically, I was supported by SAS funding uh, because it was earning under 20, uh, 25 grand a year. And, and that removed the barrier for me to think about working, providing for family, and then paying for education, but that wasn't. So that, that first barrier was then removed at that time. And therefore, here I am, new community as yourselves, or whatever you are right now. And so I am, I, I'm here pursuing that. Um, within that uh, 2016, I stumbled on an idea that the university is flexible, making education accessible for me. And then I started thinking about, so what is then then for me? What, what is that, is that, is that, is that all? What, how can I give back? But then at that point you're looking at my kids and then I'm you know, reading my children. I'm thinking about a number of other kids uh, who are in Sub-Saharan Africa who would never have such a chance to education at all. And I think that's where, um, I stumbled on the idea about, you know, starting my own um, organization, and that's the Roof of Africa. Um, so, with the theme and an understanding that the Roof of uh, the Open University has set me free in terms of how I now think, it being the EAN, I started to do research in Africa, I started to kind of get in touch and basis on how to actually start something that will open the doors for the children who studied those who are way, way, way impoverished as I was at the time. And that's where um, I think I, I did the research 2016, all of that, while studying at the same time, a parent at the same time working full time. But that's due to Open University being flexible and allowing me to um, integrate all this stuff together. But within that, 2017, we were full-fledged and non-profit registered in Scotland and operating in Africa and calling on international community to uh, to join us and help us. And then working out all, all, all the ways in which I could work with uh, people here and uh, how I could work with people in Africa. 2017, Roof of Africa itself opened its doors to 20 kids, to, to 20 children and uh, to start kindergarten and they were starting way younger than I started 
So only at the age of five, age of three, then they then the nursery classes, and then they start going. So we started open the classes, renting the building at the time. And uh, 2018 is when we start building our own school. So nowadays and today, I can report that we have a complete infrastructure. I mean, a complete classes. Yet we do need left at least three more, but we have enough to accommodate all primary one to primary seven. Uh, and so we are. We have about 277 children uh, that are now um, uh, accessing education in which they would not have access it before. Um, the area that we are focusing on, uh, it's more of it's a holistic approach where the children are the orphans, uh, the street children, those of very uh, impoverished backgrounds uh, who would never have a chance to, 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 have, this, to have this kind of education. And, and 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 the way we are delivering this is that you have education, and also we focus more, emphasizing on the family reunification as kind of a blanket of every child have a chance to have education, but also to be closer to their own families. It is more likely that they will grow up with their identity, their their, their, their love, and, and for for their people, for the educations, and for the world. Now. Enough broken a little bit there, but let's think a little bit about the power of education to change. Think about we both, both of us, uh, from every background you come from, we have all come from, a, from we have faced some barriers. Uh, some of it will be family, some of it will be just long term uh, meth. Uh, or historical background where you're told you cannot be or you cannot be educated or you're too late in life, as I was for myself. I'm too late, you cannot be educated. Uh, but then there it is, the open university itself as it is. So digitally enabling everybody to access education. Um, and so as, 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 we, as, as we can look, um, the power of education, build cohesion communities. Uh, people, people who are educated are more likely to exist together in a cohesive manner, the highest rate of tolerance as it is said in the UK itself. Uh, uh, as, so you have that, but also the economic contribution. Uh, it, it is one of the things that uh, people, the countries, as you, you can see, people from the developed world can understand that people, because of education, they, are, they, they stand a more chance of economic growth because the people that they are educated are more likely to be able to contribute to education, I mean, to education, to their own life, the, due to the skill they have, the employment uh, rate, they can, they, can, they, can, they can do that. Now, the Open University has made that possible. Uh, for me, for example, how does that help me? Uh, Critical thinking, uh, critical thinking is one of it. And that, how do I, as a person, uh, I think of myself as a responsible citizen, what I need to do for me to show up uh, in a wholesome uh, whole of myself. But again, running my own organization stems from uh, the, 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 the Open University itself the knowledge in which is impacted to me. Now I know how to interact with people, but more importantly, how do I run an organization that is ethical, legal binding, and, and that fosters inclusivity as it is the open university itself. So whenever I look at it, I, I almost see open university made me possible in that, in, in those scenarios, in that scenario. But, one would ask, Open University is helping people from across the UK to be able to gain um, skills, uh, be employable, and be a responsible citizen. Are they doing enough? They are doing a big chunk. They're the biggest university uh, in entire Europe. 
And the fact that they, that they are open, the fact that there is no barriers to join in the university itself, it helps in a lot. Because I was looking at the statistics without education or due to lack of education itself, UK itself loses 37 billion. So imagine without Open University, how much will the UK be losing at the time? Now, this, the part where I would like you to, um, sorry, let me see. Yeah, this is the part where I, I would like you to continue imagining the power of, of education within yourself. For me, it has given me the power to start my own organization and to continue championing the social justice to those who are less um, uh, privileged to access education. Um, and, and, and that's simply happened because the Open University was there, opened its doors and allowed me to access academic education which then enabled me to start thinking not just for myself but for the bigger world so as a responsible british citizen uh, who's living here uh, i'm thinking not only about how am i useful to britain but how how is how can the entire world be responsible how can this entire world come together and be successful. So part of things that I've been thinking about as I continue to run the roof of Africa is the disparities that exist within Sub-Saharan Africa. We think about right now, Sub-Saharan Africa has got 60% of its population being younger. And that is 15, 15 the years, 15 years to 24, there are young people. Those who access in education at the primary level, they are less than 14%. Now, in the few years to come, Africa is projected, yes, they're gonna have way more younger people. I fear of Africa that has got a lot of people without education, the instability in which it will cause to the world. And therefore, I see that educating Africa will help remove and reduce the, 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 the conflicts, the need to provide aid to conflict disease zones in Africa uh, due to lack of education because you imagine all these people so the younger people in that generation as they grow up they don't have formal education they don't have employment that is set to be um they don't have employment a formal employment they have more of an informal employment and then there's not going to be enough inf informal employment going further now contrast that with uk in itself where younger people yes they are way lesser than the aging generation now when you think about it in terms of europe itself as we go ahead one in four people i mean yeah, four, one in four people will be over 65 in the next uh, 50 years or so. Now, we need to have the workforce. If Africa is educated, we can collaborate with them, be it on a limited amount of arrangement in which then they can come along, uh, study, work, uh, be productive. So. I think and I see that continuing our mission in Africa to provide education, reunify families, um, I provide the holistic approaches of you know healthcare, um, well-being, and social care 
will indeed in the end be able to mitigate the risk of hu hu human collapse or humanity collapsing from you know the lack of work yes i know we're working really hard to produce robots that could help i but i think having more humans working alongside with robots in the future will help a lot and i think open university you're playing they're playing amazing um a front in order to you know open it up for someone like me myself who was impossible for education live alone impossible to exist in um given the risk face at my young age um now yes so those are a few things that i would say so one is that the open university has made me possible academically has it as many of you alumni and you're in many different part of lives and you're fo focusing on different things that you, you're doing um and therefore there is a light within you i i would normally call it psycho psycho breaker that you you have a history that you are building or you've been building uh, given the fact that uh, you did um take a step to join um open university and pursue your dreams academically but also be able to find yourself um and find a call within you for me i find a call is to off to start a nonprofit. but for you you might find like a call is you know being a doctor being a lawyer uh, um you know just being you being a writer now uh, contributing in a different ways in your life but and I, which i think only the open university make that possible um yeah so how can you be a uh, part of this movement um so now that you know that how education has uh, made me possible made you possible the danger we face if we do not educate um africa and of course continue to um, help open university open on more chances um support you know start a funding like the way sauce has its own funding supporting people from who are who are not earning enough or people from marginal backgrounds um you can come up with something as well to continue add more uh, contributing donating to missions of open university um and that way then the more chances are being opened up for people uh, who will then continue to help to prosper to humanity on my case if i were to call you which i am calling you where do i need you to help me uh, how would you help roof of africa so roof of africa is set up to build schools in more isolated and remote areas of sub-Saharan Africa. Currently, we have started in Tanzania. That's where we are based, um, on the slopes of Moshi. I mean, on the slopes of Monte Kilimanjaro. And the, the, the Moshi is a town. Um, I don't mean Moshi the games, if you do play games. Um, but Moshi, the little town on the slope of Monte Kilimanjaro. And that's where our first school is. Uh, immediately, we do need to um to build our a secondary school and that is for year 13 um going forward um that's starting next year so this year we have got 277 22 of those are graduating uh this year the end of this year the first one to graduate and they would need a secondary school a place to grow and be safe uh so uh if you um yeah let me call upon you to join me on that um um so we we need four classes but we would need one right away uh be, to be ready by january and it, to build one class full furnished that would be around 11 pound eleven thousand pound and 342 uh, that would be one class so whichever way you will we buy us one brick we will thank you um we'll buy you build us entire class we will thank you you give us books, we will thank you. Um, um, 
you decide to volunteer, we will thank you. We need teachers. So we need to train teachers. So hopefully in the future, I will approach the university and ask if my teachers will be able to train with Open University. But that's another, that's a thing for another day. Um, yeah, so if you would like to join us, uh, that's one way you could join us, volunteer. Um, you could donate to help us build a class, name it after yourself, name it after your family, or name it after your uh, a member of families or anybody or anything that close to your heart. Uh, that way, together, we can open Africa uh, too, and we can um, unleash their power of creativity. We can remove them from poverty, which is mainly contributed and brought by um, our poverty, our abject poverty, and mainly lack of education uh, play the key. Um, um, you, you will know that people who are less lit illiterate, yeah, people are less literate, uh, are more likely, they, they, they are more likely to die 29 years younger than people who are illiterate, who are literate, who are educated. So uh, there are many reasons why uh, you could join us. You could set up a funding for us. You could, you know, um, uh, apply for funding or provide materials, um, visit and just, you know, write about us. Um, I open more doors. I invite me to events <laughs> like yourselves and let me uh, uh, speak and tell people what uh, beautiful things that we do in Africa, but how um, Open University made that possible for me. Um, yeah, so yeah, so in conclusion, um, not to keep it too long for you. Uh, I know you have a lot of questions and the time has run out, but I keep it should be shorter and then you could ask me specific questions then. Um, the power of education within Open University has had a powerful impact, not only for me personally. Um, yes, I, um, I can walk around and say, you know, I'm, I'm educated. Um, I can think as an educated person around my children, uh, the, the way parents, the way I time scale, um, set my time and uh, critical thinking skills. Um, but also it has enabled me to find my inner voice um, and the inner mission. And that is to come up and set up this um, roof of Africa. The Roof of Africa, I named it the Roof of Africa because Kilimanjaro is on the slops and Kilimanjaro is the highest paid. So hopefully be able to take everybody from the poverty line to the place where they can contribute to the humanity up to their wholesome potential. Um, yes, so that is for me now. And thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Genuine, for such an inspiring story and for sharing that with us. You've mm -hmm. had an incredible journey and very difficult and much many challenges to overcome. So it's very inspiring that you accomplished so much. And given the time, I think we'll just take one of the questions that we've received and uh, yeah, we'll have to do. Maybe you can contact. Uh, we can run over by a few minutes. Well. Let's start with one question <laughs> and then we can see how far we go. So, Genuine, what was the biggest challenge that you overcame while setting up your charity? Uh, thank you for the questions. The biggest challenge, it's first is divided into one is internal. One is that you you fight and fight in the voices within me, the voices that were imparted on me as I was growing up and as a child, accepting my worthiness. I think that was one of the hard part because there is an embedded story within that says you can't be, you can't be a thing, you can't do that, you can't be this. Now, I am an environment where 
I am a young father at the time. I'm working, and, and and then here I am. I'm studying, and then I'm thinking about um, how do I accept that I can do this? How am I going to face this? Am I worth? How am I worth it? So uh, that was one of the biggest hindrances that accepting that I can. But having joined the Open University for them to, to accept me as who I am and give me the chance and study, that kind of helped me overcome that doubt that, yes, I'm worth it. I can do it. And so I overcame that self-belief um, and then to not gain the I can't side of things. That's one. But two, it's uh, navigating uh, the legal setup of a nonprofit was insurmountable. It required a lot of research and uh, the daring to ask people to join you. Uh, so the first one would be, you know, the trustees, and then they have to grill you. And what's the purpose of this? Um, and then, uh, then that's one side. So you said it from here again because it's, trans it's transnational. It's being able to uh, speak to the locals, align their needs, and make sure that everything that we are doing or we will be doing as a roof of Africa is not imposing, rather it's co collaborative and bringing out what they already could do, but they are not able to. So there was that, trying to make it that it was very challenging. I, aligning the cultural I'm, I'm i'm raised british i'm raised by british so i'm going to start an organization that's going to work in africa yes though i was you know raised back a bit by them but you know i don't know much so i had to do a lot of learning with the, within the culture and then starting the broader partnership a lot of understanding and therefore that enabled me so I would say th those two, navigating the legal setup here and the legal setup in Africa and also the cultural, uh, the, the, the culture of people, um, uh, build that trust and making sure that both things I do, they are cohesive with either side and in compliance. But then that kind of legal thinking kind of helped to put it uh, right uh, so far. So I would say that's the massive, massive challenges, those two, but they could go many there, their, their, their list is long. Uh, well, thank you for that. And I think that a lot of OU students, they, um, they, they also struggle with the self-confidence, you know, can I do it? So yes, yeah, it is important to believe in yourself. So we can do it. <laughs> yes, yes, so, indeed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so as we can run over for a few minutes, um, I'll go to the next question. So in the field of education, what are the priority areas in which businesses can make a difference to the lives of young people? Um, businesses have got a big, big place to play. Um, given right now, if, 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 you, if you look at it, but more of it, I think I'll start with the first one. Businesses can provide infrastructures. Uh, it can provide infrastructures. That could be their buildings. That they, they could be uh, uh, digital uh, devices that could assist and help um, any institution that provide an education. So the, 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 the Open University, that, oh, that the education is open. Um, opening up the centers, the, the part of their businesses as a part of educational institution could help a lot um, in terms of resources. And also they could go as far as set aside um, a chunk of percentage in their businesses. So say I start a business and I say I aim to make this amount of profit, but um, a certain number set in stones, 15% of any amount or 20% of any amount that comes from my business contribute to the educational. Um, go straight, donate it to, to universities or to, you know, the, 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 the organization that are reaching back and helping people um, 
um, access education. Um, but also the businesses could accommodate the training within their own workforce um, and work together with universities. I think Open University does that very well, works with a lot of industries. And so that be, if that if that in the long run become a culture that every business that is started as is to thrive, it signs up to university, works with the university to 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 impact their own people. So their people can either become teachers in the future of the universe that could you know be, become kind of stuff like that. Um, and I think that that could be one of the areas in which the businesses could assist was set in that time. It, it, work with the universities, partner the universities. Instead of just universities seeking to work with industries, uh, the, the industry themselves need to also be the force of that, seek to work with universities. So that becomes kind of a culture change and I'm on every person. Um, but again, it's, um, businesses have got a chance to bring in the, the disadvantaged groups, um, uh, to offer them opportunities, but also to encourage the training um, so that the, the number that they, they, they give, if they give them positive affirmation with education, um, then it brings more values um, to, 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 to the people themselves, but also the organization in the long run. So that we don't have a point where we think, oh, equality law applies here, but then now here there is no this, but then these people is possible mission with education, meet the, 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 the criteria, and therefore pushes our population forward. Um, but also, uh, which is always a big one, a digital uh, divide. So digital literacy itself, say a company like Google, a partner with universities and provide their Google uh, devices and the education scenario that way helps people. And I think it does to a point, but it becomes a custom where they have the digital power to give to, 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 to these training institutions and also their own staff to do this stuff or Apple or Microsoft work hand in hand with universities in the areas we, we are, they, they provide a lot of this. I think if they were to do this in the biggest scale, the complaints that we, the, 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 the lay people and normal citizen goes, you're not paying your taxes, you big companies. I think we'll go a little bit down because we, we, we have, they have something they're putting within the, 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 the educational areas. So I think those four things, uh, four areas to begin with could, highly are um, uh, be of importance uh, from a business perspective. Thank you, General. We only have a couple of minutes left, three minutes left. Um, so we'll take a last question which uh, was posted in the chat box. Um, so how does the charity uh, interface with education providers in the different countries? Um, so charity like ours, uh, we're uh, we're small, but we are going big, um, and therefore different countries have got different setup of law. So, for example, for us, it's a, it's a Scottish setup charity. We align with the Scottish uh, law on education. We're using UN uh, charter goals to, to, to foster their educations, but also to focus on no child is left behind, uh, knowing that over 75% of kids under the age of uh, kindergarten don't have a chance to, to, to education. So that is that. So you have a model. At, set and accepted in your setup country and then you go into these other countries you go in to see you're going to accept what they have as a mode of education and use what we have to enhance it uh, i think the co collaboration and working with the local governments in the area local leaders uh, helps a lot in terms of accepting their way of teaching and then showing how your way makes it better. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I think for us, for example, we went to Tanzania where they emphasize Swahili. And we said, yes, that's good. But 
in a, in international state, you are going to have your people do business and conduct the business in English. So we will encourage we start the kids English when they're little. Yes, when they're with their parents and stuff, they're using their Swahili is fine. And, and they can use Swahili as a subject, so kind of inverse. Uh, and therefore, um, it, it became something that you, they can look at from a bigger perspective. Uh, one, uh, seek to show what you can offer, but also do not ignore or belittle their system of education in those countries you are delivering your charitable missions. Accept their spirit in their own way, but also show how you can make it better. It's more of a collaboration to make you better as opposed to mine is better as, than yours. Um, bring them on the table, make them feel as if that they, 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 they um, make them feel as if uh, all that they're doing, they belong into it. It's not yours to bring, it's theirs and yours, so we're working together. And that's uh, one of us. Collaboration is key. Oh, thank you, Genuine. <laughs> On that note, we have to close the session because the next sessions will start in five minutes. So uh, <laughs> I would like to thank you. Um, really very inspiring story. And thank you for taking the time to talk to us this afternoon. Thank you and, so uh, much for having me. Thank you so much for having me. And looking forward to being great with many of you. Yes, well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, <laughs> thank, you. You. thank you. Bye. Bye now.